So we're turning to Romans 12, and I'm reading in the AV for those of you who are watching. We hope you've got a Bible and get to the Scriptures. And those of you listening by car, don't read the Bible as you're driving, please. Please, please, watch the traffic and smile at the person at the lights beside you. Don't race them. And as you travel along the motorway on a summer's day or wherever you are, Welcome to autumn time in Belfast. It's a real time machine, isn't it, when we get on to tape? But we trust this message will be a blessing to you, wherever you are listening. Now, we'll come in just uh, at verse number three. For I say, though through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, and that also implies every woman as well. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, I'm going to make a lot of that little phrase this evening. The measure of faith. Remember that wee phrase. It's a measure. And I want you to think of it as being like a tape measure or something you would measure with, a ruler, a standard of measurement, the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophecy according to the proportion of faith. Remember that wee phrase. The measure of faith, the proportion of faith. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kind, be affection one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I will says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Uh, if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I have entitled this message this evening at the top of your note sheet there, who am I, Lord? That's a big question. Who am I? It's a very good question. You know, pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. Think about that. Pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. There is nothing as hard to do gracefully as to get down off your high horse. But how on earth 
is it possible to be humble, really humble, in a Bible sense? How can I possibly, as I live here in Belfast, have a true estimate of myself? Who am I anyway? How can I have a sober estimate of myself and my work and my life? How can you have a sober estimate of yourself and what you are? Difficult, isn't it? How can you have a balanced judgment of yourself? Now, the whole context of Romans 12, as we saw last week, is the context of being a living sacrifice. We saw that the Levites were substituted in the Old Testament for those who came out of Egypt, the firstborn, and the firstborn belonged to the Lord, the firstborn males, because they were redeemed by blood. And they would have died if that blood had not been applied. So the firstborn uh, of all the males of, it, of that first generation coming out of Egypt, and animals as well, cattle and, and donkeys and so on, the firstborn belonged to the Lord. Uh, that is, as we would put it, they were in full-time service. No, no question about it, that was it. Then the Levites were substituted for them. The residue were redeemed out by money of that first generation. Although, as you understood from the teaching last week, every firstborn male born into uh, Israel, even in the promised land, they could be redeemed out with money, but if they weren't, then they stayed in full-time service. Hannah didn't redeem her firstborn boy out, so he remained as a priest, uh, or as a, a servant of God, rather, um, in the temple and helping in the temple, and then eventually became a judge in the land. He was not the high priest, but he helped in the service of the tabernacle. So that the firstborn were very important, and we saw very clearly that that is the background to Romans chapter 12. We too have been bought with a price. And we saw how last week that the sons of Korah, they said, no, 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 everybody is holy. None of this nonsense about this particular group uh, belong to the Lord, you know. Every, everyone is holy. And, and who do you think you are, Moses, up there? And they argued against it. And you know what happened? Moses called them to the tent door the next morning and said, Lord, you basically sort out who's right or wrong here. And the ground opened and swallowed up Korah and his cohorts. And their censers were taken and beaten and nailed to the altar of burnt offerings, so that every time an Israelite went to worship the Lord and to offer a sacrifice, there was the censers. That's a kind of a frying pan that incense was in, was beaten out, the copper was beaten out and nailed to the altar. And it was there for generation after generation to warn them that when God says something is mine, it's mine and you don't rebel. That is why Paul puts that little word in verse 1 of Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, I beseech you. It's a very serious thing. By the mercies of God, since you were shown mercy at the cost of Calvary, it is your reasonable service. You don't owe the Lord something, you owe him everything. So there's no argument about it. It is reasonable. You belong to him. And let no Christian ever rise up and say, well, I don't really belong to the Lord. And yes, I'm saved, but I can hold this back and that back. You can't if you're going to be effective for God. It is a very serious thing to be redeemed because it is the price with which you have been redeemed, Calvary's blood. So therefore, Paul says, I beseech you to present your bodies, not suicidally, but as living sacrifices. Any old dead sacrifice can lie there on the altar. But a living one kicks and fights, you know, and doesn't like being sacrificed. Well, so it is in our lives that there's plenty of kicking us against this truth. But there it is. We're beseeched by the great apostle to present our bodies as living sacrifices. In your office, in your school, in your university, in your home, wherever you are, in your factory or whatever it is, on the farm, you are a living sacrifice, living out your life in the service of God with all of your time, 
whether you drive a tractor or you dr fly Concord as a pilot or who knows who's watching, um, whatever. Whatever job you are in, you can serve the Lord. If you are a believer, uh, giving your life as a living sacrifice in your everyday tasks, you are his. That's the background. Now, now, Paul is a very balanced teacher. He knows very well that if some young person reads that and says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what's the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. And a young person begins to say, well, now, how can I fulfill that in my life? How can I really be like that? How can I really live my life as a living sacrifice? You want to give yourself up into the service of the Lord. You want your mind and body to be His. You want to be humble, and you want to have a true estimate of yourself. But He knows very well that as some young Christians or older Christians set out to make their lives a living sacrifice, there is a great danger that you will go to extremes. Here's a filly. He comes up to university. He's in his first term. He loves the Lord. Here's a girl the same. I want to really serve the Lord. So they're sitting in their lecture some morning and say, I'd better tell that professor he needs to be saved, you know. And the poor guy's hardly finished his lecture till he's down with him with a wee track and saying, are you saved, mister? Yeah. And he can hardly sit in any lecture and he can hardly sit anywhere, but he, he's witnessing and witnessing and witnessing and, and that's all very well and that's all very important, but there are such a thing in this world as exams. Yeah. And you ought to the state to work right there at your exams because you have a great privilege that many another generation didn't have. You say, I heard Neil Kinnock say that long ago in the last election. Yeah, well, okay. It was fascinating that speech that the American uh, Republican picked up and said the same thing. You know, well, it's true, but it's true. It's a great privilege, and it's important to witness. But exams are exams. And you see, sometimes you have young people and they go to extremes and they are so busy going to meetings and so busy studying their Bibles and so busy witnessing for the Lord that uh, they become fanatics. And instead of winning the professor for the Lord, they, they drive them up the walls. And they are also hopeless students as well. And when they hand in an essay to him, you know, um, well, their left hand doesn't know what their right hand doeth. Sloppy. Very important. That we understand these things, get a balance into them. And sometimes you can see this situation coming where a person doesn't get the balance right and doesn't have a proper estimate of what they are doing. Now, I had a friend. Uh, he's, he's, he's the, he is now the Baptist pastor in Kerry Duff. His name is William Cunningham, and he is a very, very gifted preacher. And it was my great privilege when I was at school to lead him to Christ one night because we were at school together. I went to a crazy school. It was called Down High <laughs> in Down Patrick. William was one of my best friends, and he got saved. And I remember when William did his, did his Master of Philosophy degree next door at Queen's, and it is a very, very difficult degree. I did a year of it, and you can see what happened to me. You can imagine what happened to him when he was doing a, a, a master's degree in it. The, the fellow was brilliant, and he may be embarrassed if he's watching or hears of this, but he was brilliant. He was a brilliant student. And a very gifted student, and philosophy is a very difficult subject, studying everything from Jean-Paul Sartre right through to communism, to Marx, to all the rest of it, and comparing them all, and the philosophies of the generations, and uh, the Christians came in for a lot of stick as they studied the philosophies and, of the world, Plato, Aristotle, all the rest. And I remember when William, William um, graduated, he was invited uh, by his then professor to uh, come to his home, and all his graduating students or whatever of that year were invited. William went, and he went round every single member of that faculty and asked them if they were born again. Whew. I would have hardly asked them the time of day, never talk about if they were born again, because they were brilliant men. 
And they could argue, and I had a fair bit of stick in my, in my time, in my year in there, because of Christian things. And I always admired William for that. What courage he had to speak up for Christ. But he did it in the right place, at the right time, and carefully and wisely, and planted his question tactfully. And he was also a brilliant student and did his work, which backed home his witness. And I, I know what I'm talking about when, I, when I'm talking about this, that some people, even when they get a job or, or whatever, that they get imbalanced in their Christian witness and they don't know their work properly, don't do their work properly, and they are just one great pain in the neck in the business. And people say those boys and girls are fellows and men and women, they're so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly use. And then, of course, if they fail their exam because they aren't working and they aren't doing the proper work and they're going, just going to too many meetings, etc., and they're not getting the balance right between their works, work and, and Christian study and, and witness, then when they fail, they think, oh, well, now, well, now, I haven't been witnessing enough, and this is the Lord's punishment. I mean, they have the craziest ideas for why they failed. The Lord's punishing me because I'm not witnessing enough, and then, then they go to further extreme. It's a living sacrifice the Lord wants, not a suicide. Here is a soldier, and he's in the trenches. Let's say we're in the First World War. Those mucky, dirty trenches, that awful war fought in mud with so many Ulstermen that the psalm lost their lives, of whom we are very proud and have very revered memories in this land, and some of you have relatives probably who were killed in that awful battle. You think of those soldiers there, even Ulsterman fighting in those First World War trenches. Now, you know very well that he's there to fight, and he's there to win the fight. But he also has a responsibility to his commander and to the rest to do his very best to stay alive. And although he's fighting and he's going out over the top, he just doesn't put his head up every now and again and see how they're getting on over there. And, uh, you know, stupidly wander about no man's land because he'd be cut down. I'm not in any way trying to be sarcastic or funny. It is, a, it is an inherent thing that is vital if you're going to be a good soldier to not only fight... But you ought to those around you to do your very best to stay alive. And when you go to work for Christ, some people get so fanatical in it and silly in it in the way that they approach and they are so extreme that their health begins to break down. You say, you watch it, Derek. You know, you're one to be talking. I, I know a lot of you are thinking that because I love you and in Christ, and you say, look, watch, you don't go over the top and work too hard or preach too much or study too much. I, I know this applies to me, and I've got to be very careful just as well as you. I, I, can, I can go to an extreme just as much as you and get so involved in Christ's work, I have hardly any time for my family or hardly any time to straighten my tie hardly or even comb my hair or something like that. It's, it, it's crazy. Uh, preachers are just as open to this as anybody else, and I preach to my own heart. We ought to the church, and we ought to our families, and we ought to the Lord to have a balance in our lives of relaxation and good, healthy eating and good exercise uh, so that we care for these bodies. The Lord Jesus told his disciples to come away into the desert and to rest a while. Come apart and rest a while. And it's true. If you don't come apart and rest, you will come apart full stop. It's absolutely true. So the first thing that would help you to have a proper estimate of whatever gift you have and whatever thing the Lord has given you, work the Lord has given you to do and the gift to do it, you must remember that self-giving, if not controlled, point 1A, by sober thinking, can lead to a breakdown. And it has happened again and again, and I've had to deal with it. People actually breaking down because they haven't had the proper rest. So when you serve the Lord, have a, a sober view of health and rest 
and also of witness and work and keep a balance in it. A balance is very important. Nowhere in the Bible are you ever told to be rude or to break people's privacy even by your witness. You must be very careful that you don't break these things because you can, you can drive people away. When the Lord Jesus went to w win the woman at the well, notice he was not fanatical. He didn't say, look here, Mrs., you're going to hell. You've had four husbands and the one you've got at the moment isn't your husband and you're finished and you need to be saved. He'd have frightened the life out of her if he had said that first of all. Notice what he did. He sat down by the well to rest in the heat. And what could Christ and what seems to be an immoral woman have in common? Better not hold this up because you all want a drink. I know that. My daughter always tells me when I drink this in public, you know, uh, wish I could have one too. Well, the fact is, I'll leave her a wee bit afterwards. <laughs> but the fact is that the only thing that they had in common was, what, was, it, what, was water. She came to get water, and Christ was there because he was thirsty. And the Lord started with, with the water. He talked to her about water. You say, well, how could you lead a woman to Christ talking about H2O? Well, you can because that led on to her. Uh, he said, well, I could give you living water, you see, that you'd never thirst again. And she said, well, how could you give me this water? And, and then when he told her who he was the, and, and Messiah, etc., she said, sir, give me this water. And then Jesus said, ah, you have had four husbands and five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. And she then confessed to her need. You know, you need, to, you need to confess your sin and repent of your sin if you're going to be converted. But notice how gently and carefully and wisely the Lord Jesus led her to repentance. And I think it's amazing that the first thing the woman did was that she went to the men of the city and told them, come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? That's very significant. She was, I reckon, pretty well known amongst the men. And she went to the men. She had thoroughly repented and wanted them to find Christ. Wonderful, the little, even the little side strokes of the Bible, little brush strokes of the Bible. But notice how he did it. I think this is very important. You want a proper estimate of yourself and of your gift. Then you must be very careful that you have sober thinking regarding controlling that self-giving. Because, you know, if you give and 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 never take in, you will crack. Keep the balance. And it's very important. Keep alive. We want you for many years to serve the Lord, not just a month or two to burn out. It's maybe a very dangerous phrase that is used in evangelical circles, better to burn out than rust out. Is that a Bible phrase? Whoever says in the Bible that God says you have to be fanatical and burn out without sleep or proper food or whatever. There are times when the Lord's work will, you will have to sacrifice and give for it and your time will be invaded, that's true. But keep the balance. And it'll be very important. Christ did. You'll stay alive a lot longer at your work. Then secondly, by, by not being upset if you haven't got somebody else's gift. Because you haven't led a million people to the Lord, are you going to give up? And not do that lowly thing that the Lord has given you to do. Because you haven't led a huge number to the Lord, you're not going to do anything or do that lowly thing he has given you to do. God does not leave you without something by which to measure a proper estimate of yourself and of the gift you have. Don't get envious of somebody else's gift. 
God will give you a, a measure, a standard by which to work out how you're doing and what your gift is. And that is called in verse 3 the measure of faith, and it's called in verse 6 the proportion of faith. I don't think it means that he gives you so much faith and then he gives Jimmy over here far more faith and Mary over here, she gets a little less faith and that the Lord gives to us all a kind of a, a proportion of faith in the sense he gives one more than the other. Rather, in this particular context, it seems to me, and I suggest this, that this is this measure of faith is the whole body of doctrine. To put it in plain, simple terms, all that's in the Bible. That's your measure. Now, let's say that God gifts you in a certain area. Yeah? But suddenly, you are overwhelmed with a feeling of inadequacy of your own sin. And you say, well, well, I'm an absolute rotter. I know I'm a rotter. I, I can't go and do that for the Lord because I'm rotten. If they knew what I really was in here and what I think in here, they never listened to me or whatever. So you feel you're a rotter. Well, don't we all, if we were honest? So what do you do? Do you quit? No, no. You bring that feeling of inadequacy uh, to the measure. And you say, well, now, what has the Bible got to say about feelings of being a rotter and no good and sinful in the service of the Lord? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about it. Didn't we read in Romans 3 that the whole world is guilty before God? God knows you're a rotter. And he took you on. He knows that. Now, Paul was called to be a very unique thing. He was called to be an apostle. We don't have classical apo apostles today. That was a foundational gift. He was the classical apostle, along with the others, 12, and says so. But does he go around saying, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle, I'm, I'm a great apostle, I, I'm God? No, no, he says... I am called to be an apostle, but he says, I am less than the least of all saints. You say, my goodness, is that what he said? Yes, that's what he said. I am less than the very lowliest Christian in the church. Just because I have this great gift from God and this great calling from God doesn't mean that I'm high and mighty and more important than that wee child down there and that a uh, church in Rome or whatever who just trusted Christ as a five-year-old or whatever. No. How has he a balance that he doesn't get a big head and proud? Because he has the measure of the body of doctrine. God gave him the gift. And it was God who gave him so he doesn't boast about it. And he knows that in himself there is no good thing apart from what he has in Christ. And he says that he's less than the least of all sins. You see, this is the teaching. Here is the measure of faith. And when you feel discouraged, what do you do? You go to the Bible. And the Bible tells you that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And you remember, of course, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And we learned from tabernacle studies, didn't we? That when the priest would serve uh, in, that, uh, in that sanctuary, if he tripped and fell, the great light of the tabernacle was there, the great candlestick light, lampstand light, and he would trip and fall. But he was still in the light even though he went on his ear. And even though he was on the ground. And all the time he was in the light, and the blood that was shed out there at the burnt offering, at the sacrifice, was still atoning for him in there. And the wonderful thing is, of course, that he was able to pick himself up and keep going. And you and I know that we are in the light. We've come to know Christ. He is our light. And we walk in his light. And when we fail and when we sin and go down, his blood still atones. So we get up again and go on, because we're in the light. And you take all that body of doctrine, I mean, it's just packed from Genesis to Revelation to help you, inspire you, to pick yourself up and go on again. 
That's the measure of faith, the proportion of faith. What is it? Well, Jude verse 3 says that we should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That is what I'm talking about. The faith once delivered unto the saints. The body of doctrine. Jude verse 3 for those of you taking notes. But let's say, let's say that we now face a certain gift. Well, okay, let's look at it very, very quickly. The measuring tape is here. The reason for our humility in verses 4 and 5, for we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. We belong to a body, we're not all the head. So that keeps us humble. That's the reason for our humility. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. And you know all the teaching that goes with that. If you have a sore toe, the rest of your body knows about it. If you have a toothache, oh, the thought of it, may you not have it tonight. The whole of your body suffers with that tiny little tooth. If you have earache, all your body feels it. You know, the ear doesn't grow up and say I'm more important than all the rest of the members. That, that's the teaching. We're part of the body of Christ. If we're born again, people... We all have a function, and that keeps us humble because we're part of the body. We're not the whole cheese or the whole body. Okay, so that's the reason then for the humility uh, with regard to an estimate of ourselves and the way to estimate your gift and the way you're living and how you're getting on is to set the Bible against what you've done. And it'll help you always. What would we do without it? Now, Paul picks up here suddenly... A gift. Having then, verse 6, gifts differing according to the grace that is given us. Notice very carefully that it is a grace gift. It's God's sovereign grace gave you the gift. It's a grace gift. And all these gifts are grace gifts. They're given by the God of grace, the sovereign God of grace. You didn't pick it, he gave it to you. In that sense, ultimately. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And he picks up one and he says, now let's take the gift of prophecy, for example. Now all sorts of controversy has raged around this little word, prophecy. What is it? Is it functioning today in the church? What kind of a gift is it? Well, let me look at it very simply. What was a prophet in the Bible context according to the measure of faith? Yeah? Let's take the measure of faith and measure this prophecy against the whole body of doctrine. All right? All right. It's very clear in the Old Testament that a prophet was somebody who suddenly stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Maybe he would say something was going to happen in the future. Maybe he would say God was going to bring judgment on them. Maybe he would apply a particular truth to what they were up to at that particular time. But that prophet didn't bring a word from the Lord um, didn't the prophet always brought not a word from the Lord for the moment sorry that's put wrong there in your notes let me just get that right in verse 3 that should simply read let me see how that'll go a prophet let me put it let me put it this way here here is the word right the word that's the word, isn't it? All of it. And I could preach to you from the word half a night, as you very well know. Yeah? But you mightn't get much help. Because I would be preaching the word, yes. But if I were to stand up here tonight and I were to bring you the word from the Lord for the moment... That would be different. 
You know how it is? You go to hear some preachers, and there's nothing in it. And you go home, and you might as well have stayed at home. I'm not being sarcastic. This applies to me too. But there is that moment when a preacher will rise, and he'll start to preach, and you say, hey, somebody told him about me. Hey, I wonder, I wonder did Mary tell him about me? Or, or did my mother talk to him? Or, 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 or. I wonder, how does he know that? And in fact, he doesn't know at all. What has happened is, he is preaching from the Word. But the Word that he is preaching is not just the whole body of doctrine, but it is the Word for you for that particular time. And you say, that's for me. How many people on Tuesday nights over 10 years have come up and said, that was for me. That was for me. If you knew where I am at the moment and, and, and how that word came to me, well, I didn't know where you were at the moment. But you see, it just so happened that at that particular moment, I had the word from the Lord for you for that moment. Now, that's a prophet. And that's a prophet talking. You know that it is not just a word from the Lord, but the word from the Lord for you. And that's a gift. That's a gift. And of course, right here, the scriptures are very, very clear that the Bible always teaches that when a prophet stands up and says, thus saith the Lord, even bringing you the word of the Lord for your age, for your generation, for your home. It has to be measured according to what all the Bible says. And if it doesn't measure up to this, then it's not the word from the Lord, my friend. You see, I don't believe we have classical prophets today. Ephesians 3 and 20 says that we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That is Elijah and Elisha and Moses and so on and so forth. All of those, according to Ephesians 3 and 20, all of those were prophets who give us this. So that if somebody stands up in the church and says, well, I have the gift of prophecy, you know. I'm a prophet. And they stand up in the church and they say, thus saith the Lord. Well, you'd have to be very careful if somebody did that because no way is that person a prophet in the Old Testament or classical sense as a foundational prophet. Else, every time somebody got up and said that, we'd all get our pens out and say, you know, here's Jimmy, and he says he's a prophet, and we start, or Mary, or whatever, and we start writing down what they all say. And that becomes the Bible. More of the Bible. No. This is, as I say again from Jude 3, this is the faith which was once delivered to the saints. There it is. You have it. And as somebody rises and they say that they have the word from the Lord for today, then you have the privilege of checking them out and you get your measure out in your mind. And you measure what, you, what they say by what you know of the faith. Because we know that this is how false cults start. Men say they have sudden visions on some mountainside somewhere and they have uh, their prophets and present-day prophets and they have the word from the Lord. And it's crazy, man. It's crazy. We have the proportion of faith to apply to prophecy according to verse 6. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. 
And I don't think that there is any uh, warrant in Scripture, and let me say this gently, I, I don't think there's any warrant in Scripture for anybody to stand up and say, I have a prophecy, I have a prophecy, I have a prophecy. In this sense, the saints can judge whether or not it is the word from the Lord for them for that morning. They can judge whether it is or not. You don't have to stand up and say, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. They know they can judge according to the proportion of faith, the Bible. You see, if somebody were to stand up and say, well, I've got a word or the word from the Lord for my life today. I have a real prophecy. God said to Abram, get thee out of thy kindred. So I'm getting out from my family and I'm going to live with Mrs. So-and-so who is Mr. So-and-so's wife. And God said to Abram, get thee out from thy kindred so I'm getting out from mine. Well, you would know that that was crazy. The Bible would condemn you. The Bible is against it. You could judge his word according to the word of the Lord. Lots of people, you see, they love excitement of what they think is prophecy. But what they think is prophecy has to be tested by the measure or the analogy of the faith. Let me give you an example of this. An outstanding preacher in Britain, still alive, recently preached in a pulpit. And he said, and it's on tape, that on his way to the service, he had been given the word from the Lord, or a word from the Lord, on the way to the service. He said that the important thing in the Christian life was the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And he said that John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And that's true, the Bible says so, that John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. But he said, as Jesus wasn't anointed until he went to the banks of the Jordan, before John, what he said and did up until that time wasn't worth recording. And that's why you have silence about the life of Christ and the teenage life of Christ and the young manhood of Christ until 30 years of age. Because, he says, it's quite obvious, he says, John was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, but the Holy Spirit, he said, only fell on Christ right then, and therefore there is nothing said in the Bible about Christ's early life. That's why it's all silent. And if you're not anointed with the Holy Spirit, then no matter what you do for the Lord, is all useless, not worth recording. And he built a great thing on this. This was the word from the Lord for the morning. Well, you wouldn't be listening to a man like that very long until you'd be getting your wee measure out or your big measure out. And you would start testing what he was saying as being the word from the Lord and what the Lord had taught him, and this was the word for our generation or whatever, according to Scripture. If you heard a man say a thing like that, you would know he was absolutely out of line if you used your measuring tape. Why? Because you know that John the Baptist's life in childhood is also surrounded with silence. There's not a word about it until he came out of the, out of the desert preaching. Never hear a thing about it. The same silence is in John's childhood. As you got out your measuring tape of the body of doctrine against what that gentleman would be saying, well meaning but saying, you would know that that statement makes our Lord Jesus inferior in his childhood to John, which is blasphemy. We are told in Luke's gospel that when Elizabeth, John's mother, was standing in the hill country in her home or in her home. And Mary 
the expectant mother of Christ came through the door and Mary gave a salutation to Elizabeth. Remember that Christ and John the Baptist were cousins. As she came through the door and gave her salutation to Elizabeth, the Bible says that Elizabeth's baby, yet unborn, John in the womb, leaped. And then it later qualifies it. It says that the baby leaped in her womb for joy. What was that? Oh, that was an unborn prophet praising an unborn king. So you see, if you listen to a statement like that and somebody says, oh, I think this is the word for, the, for today, etc., you can check it out according to Scripture and know whether it is or not. You're not left to wonder about and say, well, he could be right, he could be right. If he doesn't tie up with this in here, then it's no use. And there's also a very serious thing. We've got to remember that in the Old Testament, when somebody stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord, if it proved not to be thus saith the Lord, that prophet was in serious trouble. Deuteronomy 13. Just check this. It's worth it. Deuteronomy 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and, a give, a, a, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, obey his voice, and serve him and cleave to him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee and then chapter 18 where it's even further defined 18 and verse 20 but the prophet, which, Deuteronomy 18 and 20, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass... That is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Do you know there was a gentleman in Vienna, a Christian, rose up recently and said there was going to be an earthquake. The Lord had spoken to him. There was going to be an earthquake in Vienna. And Christians in Austria, Austrian Christians, left the city of Vienna. But the earthquake never came. What would have happened to that man in an Old Testament sense? Be a dead man. So it is a very serious thing if someone comes along to you and says, I've had a word from the Lord, you know, and you're going to have a baby and it's going to be a boy. Or it's going to be a girl. Or it's going to be a missionary. Or I've had a word from the Lord and, and you're going to get a new business. You be very careful what you attribute to what the Lord has told you. This is where the whole danger lies. Because if you're wrong... Look at the serious consequences in the Old Testament sense. I am not saying that the Lord cannot prompt someone to say something or to warn someone. God is a God who is a great God. There was a man called Agapus in the New Testament who, who was told by the Lord there was a famine coming. And he was right, there was. 
But he was in trouble if there wasn't. So let's get the balance into this teaching. And it's very, very important. God takes a very serious view of anybody who doesn't give a true, thus saith the Lord. So every time you hear somebody get up and say, I'm a prophet, you know, and this is my prophecy, you just get out your measure of faith. I like what John Stott says. John Stott says he doesn't think that we can apply the word, the noun prophet, to the church today. In in the full biblical sense. But he reckons we can apply the adjective prophetic. That is, taking what is already here and applying it. God can use that person to bring a message to their own generation. Now, I believe I've been called to serve my generation. And to take the measure of faith and the proportion of faith and to preach it and teach it and apply it to people's hearts. And I trust it's a voice to my generation, or else I would feel I was wasting my time. And God can use you to bring a word in that very office of yours. As I say, on that farm, in in your university or college, in your home situation, to bring a word for the moment. You arrive into a situation where there's a death or a bereavement, and the Lord gives you a word for the people from his word, and you give it, and it's like the very dew of heaven to those people. And they will say, the Lord sent you. Absolutely. I mean, I often tell it. I was was going from, years ago, I was going from Inneskillen to Newcastle, which is a fair wee jaunt. And I'd got a new car, and I was bringing it home. And our first child was just a wee baby in the back. I can't see her yet. And Mark and I were driving through, and suddenly I felt this fantastic urge on my heart to go and see a friend of mine who was very ill. And I thought, Lord, the last thing in the woman, uh, Mrs. Mulholland will want to see is me this morning. Her husband is very ill, and she'll not want to see a preacher. But I went on down the road, and I, I couldn't drive anymore. I, I said, Margaret, I'm going to have to go and see my friend Norman. And I, I, I turned, the, turned, turned the car around on, on the road, and I went back, and, and I rang a doorbell. 32 Edward Street. Always knew it. He said, Derek, when you come to see me, my house is the 23rd Sam, the other way around. And I rang the doorbell, and, and I'll never forget it. It's etched on my mind. There he was, if I remember right, standing with his dressing gown on, and he was crying. When he saw me, he was weeping. Derek, he said, Derek. I said, yes, Norman. Derek. He said, I was just down on my knees by the fire asking the Lord to send you to me. Boy, was I glad I had stopped the car. He says, come on in. Shut the door. I went in and sat down. Mrs. Mulholland has always made me a a lovely wee cup of tea and baby and everything. And we all sat down and Norman leaned across to me. He said, Derek, I've been thinking about a wee verse in the Bible. It says, it says, um, and it came to pass. I said, Norman, that's all over the Bible. I says, that's true, and it came to pass this, and Moses did that, and it came to pass, it came to pass. He says, have you ever thought about it? I thought, what's this man on about? He says, it's a wonderful verse that, you know, and it came to pass. So I'm sipping my tea and looking at him, you see. He says, uh, do you realize, he says, that... Um, Sickness comes to pass. It passes, you know, eventually. Oh, that's right, Norman. He says, the rain comes to pass. Well, thank the Lord, that's true. And the wind too. He says, holidays come to pass. He says, most things in life come to pass. He says, have you ever thought about the things that come to stay? Eternal life when you trust Christ as your Savior forgiveness of sins, peace with God, etc. I said, Norman, that's a lovely message. Aye, he said, isn't it? And I never held a full conversation with him again. In three weeks, he was dead. And I was standing by his graveside. And you've guessed it. What was my text for that message that day? 
I preached on the text, and it came to pass. And the lovely thing is, a couple of people got saved through it. Now, that's what I'm talking about. That man had the word from the Lord for me that morning. And God stopped me on the road and took me to the house to get me the message to deliver it. And God can do that with you. Never, ever let anybody have God boxed into a wee corner that God is not a supernatural God and can break across natural things. Of course he can. But any wild exaggeration in this whole area, you check it by the measure of faith. Lovely, isn't it? To have the measure of faith. Now, the rest of this chapter is so practical. Then we begin to move on into another kind of... Uh, look how I've divided it up there in your notes to keep it very straightforward. The gift of ministry comes next. Now, that is the practical application of the Word of God to your daily living. If I am a doctor and I have the secret cure to an epidemic that's raging in the city down below me. Say I live on a great hill in a city, and I'm a brilliant doctor, which I'll never be, but let's say I was, and I had this cure, and I have it all in my head, and it's in the books here and everything, but I let the whole city just die, and I say, well, I'll just sit up here and study my books. What use would that be? And if you and I have the word from the Lord and a word from the Lord for the people of occasions and so on, what use is it if we sit in our studies all the time and never come out with it? Or in our Bible studies or in our uh, church groups and never get out into the big wide world? Ministry is the application of this body of doctrine to everyday living. Then there is the gift of teaching. That's in verse number 7. He that teacheth on teaching. That's applying particularly the Word of God to people's minds. Then there is the exhorter. He's in verse 8, or the person who exhorts on exhortation. That is, taking the Word of God and using it to stir people's hearts. You know those lovely gifts that are in the church where somebody gets up and exhorts you and you want to get out and really win the world for the Lord? They're an exhorter and they stir your conscience with the Word of God. And then we move into more general gifts. You know, a lot of people are, are, are crying to God for gifts and crying and nearly going out of their minds to get gifts. I don't hear too many crying about this one. You know, the gift of giving. <laughs> Not all that many queuing up to give their money away for the Lord, are they? He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. That's the expansion of God's work. He that ruleth, that's the leadership. That's the overseeing of God's work. And even, indeed, the administering of things. They tell me the word is. And then there is, there is that lovely gift of the person who can go to people in great distress, and not everybody can do this, and show mercy to the sinner who is, maybe a Christian has fallen into dire straits of evil and so on. They can show them mercy, and they don't come with a face like 50 lurgan spades. They, they come in, and they show mercy with cheerfulness. And perhaps that's even a gift of visitation in hospitals, you know. <laughs> Some people aren't very good at it. I know because I've been in hospital <laughs> and I've been on the receiving end. And I thought, I'm going to lie here and I'm going to study everybody comes in here and see how it's done. <laughs> and it's very interesting when you're on the, on the pillow and not standing by the bed. The crazy things that people can say. And I will not expand. I'm not very good at it either, are you? But there it is. It's a gift with cheerfulness. To be able to help people in distress with cheerfulness. And then he moves in here and he goes from verse 9 
down this lovely list of things that everybody can do. You may not be gifted to rise and give the word from the Lord for that particular breaking of bread service or that particular graveside or that particular bedside, but you can have love, as I have call it, called it here, without wax. You know, in the big Greek columns, you know, in the temples, and you used to crack, they used to put wax in it, and it had the kind of vein of the marble in it, and it looked as if it was, was the real thing. It was only wax. You go down to Castle Ward there, which is my favorite country house in Ulster, owned by the National Trust, a beautiful place. And they'll show you, they'll show you that it's just wax imitation around the columns in the lovely entrance hall. But I remember the lady explaining there's a huge bust of a man there on the, on the mantelpiece. And he said, it takes three men to lift that down. It's real marble. But you see, you could have a fake thing and then the fire would come. And what would happen? It would crumble because it was only wax. Now, don't be hypocrites, says Paul. Let your love be sincere. Not just a false old thing. Let's really, truly love each other. Abhor that which is evil and, and cleave to that which is good. <laughs> there was a fellow going past a window one day. <laughs> you have to think to pick this up, but I think it's good. <laughs> he was going past the window one day and he saw this book in it and it said the title, How to Hug. And being of a romantic turn of mind, he went in and went to buy the book, wanted to learn how to hug, or how to do it better, and to hug the one he loved. So he said, could I have that book, How to Hug? And the man looked at him and looked at the book. He said, sir. He said, sir. He said, what are you asking for? Oh, he said, the book, How to Hug. He says, that's not the title of the book. He said, that's an encyclopedia, and it begins with the word how, and it goes right through to the word hug. <laughs> how to hug. <laughs> how to hug. And I was thinking when I read that story that sometimes people come to the Christian church and they say, that's the place where people really love each other, sincerely. Not lust, not immorality, not sin, not evil, but pure, real Christian love. And they come in to see how we love. And what do they get? They get nothing but just a mere encyclopedia of doctrine. As dry sometimes as can be. Because there's no real love in it. I hope that's not what you find in your church. And I hope you'll never find it here. Let your love be sincere. Let it be real. Not just, not just encyclopedic. Then he moves in and he says... Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Don't have sham love, abhor evil, cleave to what is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. That's Christian love between brothers and sisters in Christ because there's no limit to the good a man can do if he doesn't care who gets the credit. True Christian love remembers that it's there because that is my brother or my sister in Christ. It's not just friendship. It's not just because I like them or have the same tastes as they have. If they are my brother and sister in Christ, they are my brother and sister in Christ. And it's not just merely a friendship. It is an eternal relationship. So we ought to love one another, kindly affectioned one to another, in honor preferring one another. Don't be slothful in your business. Be fervent in spirit. Always be enthusiastic as you serve the Lord. Not with an old lukewarmness. Lukewarmness angers God. You're serving Him. You have His promises. So you rejoice in hope. You are patient in tribulation. You continue faithfully in prayer. You distribute to the necessity of the saints. You give yourself to hospitality. And then he says, when your enemies come against you 
and start to persecute you, don't curse them. I mean, olden days, you know, they used to call down curses. Don't you call down curses. Call down blessings on their heads. Call down blessings. I remember I said to a man once, the Lord bless you. And he was really angry. And he went around telling people, that fellow Derek Bingham said, said, God bless you. What does he mean by saying to me, God bless you? And he was really angry. Not even allowed to say, Lord bless you. But God knows I meant it, and I love him still. But that's what we are to do. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. And rejoice with those who rejoice. Yeah. Somebody does well, you rejoice with them. And if somebody comes into the office and sits down and they're weary and tired and down, don't you start whistling. <laughs> and jumping up and down, isn't it a lovely day? Isn't it a great day? What on earth's wrong with you? The, the worst thing in the world for a person who is depressed and down is somebody cheerful. It makes them even more depressed. This passage is saying, if somebody is weeping, don't whistle. If somebody is weeping, don't say, ah, pull your socks up and cheer up, have a pull of mint, you'll be all right. <laughs> Some Christians do that. No. If somebody is genuinely weeping and in trouble, then you identify with where they are and don't come across with a false thing. Sit down with them and weep with them. And be of the same mind one to another. And you see that thing creeping in again in verse 16, you know, the measure of faith. That's how we have it. The same body of doctrine, measuring things by the word will unite us. Mind not high things, but condescend the men of low estate. Don't be proud. And if someone is, hasn't much of this world's goods or you can't name drop their name, people very seldom talk about their, their poor relatives. They always talk about their rich ones. Well, condescend to men of low estate and don't be conceited. Don't recompense evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, and if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You can't always do that. There will be conflict, but as far as is possible, live peacefully with all men. And then comes this amazing wee statement in here. This is fantastic at the end of this passage. You know, verse 14, don't curse. Verse 17, don't retaliate. Verse 18, don't take revenge. Or verse 19. You see, I know what you're thinking as we come to the end of this amazing chapter. You're saying, oh, okay. If my enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he thirst, give him drink. Yes, uh, don't curse my enemy. Be kind to my enemy. Don't recompense evil for evil. This is all very soft business. It's not real. Because if somebody does something desperately wrong, does it mean that we'd just be nice to them and, and you know, and, and we'd be, be kind to them and feed them and look after them? And if they're murdering everybody in the street and bombing half the city apart, that, that we just, you know, we're kind to them and, and so on. People have terrible problems with this passage. Look, my friend, can I say it gently? Nowhere in this passage is God saying that he will not take revenge on those who perpetrate such things. Nowhere in this passage is God saying that he will not avenge the Holocaust and the men who took those precious Jews and burnt some of them alive never to talk of gas them before they were burnt. Millions of them. Nowhere is this passage saying that God slept and that he will not avenge what happened. He will avenge. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
What did he mean? That was the Roman soldiers who were nailing his hands to the cross. They didn't know what they were doing. But that doesn't mean to say that all who did it didn't know what they were doing. You will notice in, in Peter that First Peter says, when he was reviled, he reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not. Jesus didn't revile again, and he didn't threaten. But what does it say? He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. In other words, there is a day coming when God will have a day of judgment. And my friend, when his vengeance arises, it beggars human description. Notice what it says. If your enemy does something on you, don't you take it in your hands to murder him or avenge what he's done. You leave the avenging with God because it's God's prerogative. You say, where is the love of God in this? Ah, the love of God is here because if Christ had annihilated all those who knew what they were doing when they hounded him to the tree and had annihilated all those who have broken his law and have turned against him, I would never have got saved. Calvary would never have happened. He died on the cross and even for those very guards who put those people into those ovens. As Corrie Ten Boom said, she preaching one night somewhere and she was talking about her life and there was a guard sitting in the meeting who had done a terrible thing on her sister in Ravensbrook. And she said, he came over to me and I recognized him, wicked man that he was. And she says, I couldn't get my hand out of my pocket to shake his hand. But she said, I had to for Jesus' sake. And the man had actually become a Christian. Even to those perpetrators, this day of grace is still open. And to all who will repent of their sin and turn away from the terrible things and crimes they have done, even if you're listening to me, my friend, and you have committed some awful crime and you're in this service and you say there's no forgiveness, there is. Christ's blood can cleanse you if you repent. But my friend, if you don't repent... And millions don't. Incredible numbers don't. Don't you think that it's all over? Because vengeance is mine, God says, I will repay, saith the Lord. He holds back at this time. But my friend, if you die unrepentant, whoever you are, if you are without Christ, the vengeance will fall if God didn't have vengeance and justice against the things that have been done in this world. Heaven would turn black. The very earth cries for it. Think of that poor man on shore the other night, that young lad left over now, an older man walking across those fields and lifting that soil just made up with bones of people who had been buried there, 140,000 of them until the very soil is made up of their bones, broken into little tiny microscopic pieces, running it through his hands. I looked at him, and I think of this verse, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So if you're thinking of having a go at somebody because they've done something on you, don't. If somebody is persecuting you, you be kind to them so that you might, what? Heap coals of fire on their head. That means shame them to repentance so that they might find your Savior. Ere his vengeance catches up with them and they perish forever. That's why we feed them. That's why we give them Give them water to drink. That's why we don't take arms in our hands and go against our enemies as individuals and kill them. That's why we are not to take justice into our personal hands. We are to leave that with the Lord. That is his prerogative. 
And next week, we shall see that God gives present day justice and the application of justice to the government. And we'll see how that we are commanded in the Word to obey the powers that be. So I reckon you'll be back. Shall we pray? Our Father, thank you for your mighty word. And we thank you, Father, for the fact that vengeance is yours and you will repay. It belongs to you. And Father, our prayer is that this evening we will go out of this place with our hearts bowed with the power of the word. And that, Father, no individual here will take vengeance into his hand or her hand, whether by spiteful word, filthy word, filthy action, to do anything evil against anyone. Rather, we leave, leave that with you, Lord. For vengeance is my own personal prerogative, you say. I will repay. So, Father, by our lives, may we shame by our Christian kindness, our very enemies into the kingdom of God, that they might not perish, but come to know our Lord Jesus too. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.